night. Searching for Mexico's disappeared. In este país, it's más fácil encontrar la muerte que encontrar justicia. Why North Korea could strike first, and a new livelihood for coal workers. GOP senators announced today that they're scrapping plans to vote on the Graham-Cassidy bill after three Republicans came out against it. It's the latest in a string of defeats in the effort to repeal Obamacare, but Republican leaders vowed this isn't the end. We're coming back to this after taxes. We're going to have time to explain our concept. We'll have a better process, and we're going to take this show on the road. This morning, the mayor of San Juan said the situation is life or death on the island and urged agencies to speed up direct aid. President Trump says he'll travel to Puerto Rico next week. We've worked very, very hard in Puerto Rico. It's very tough because it's an island. In Texas, we can ship the trucks right out there and, you know, we can do, we've, we've got A pluses on Texas and on Florida. And uh, we will also on Puerto Rico. But the difference is this is an island sitting in the middle of an ocean. And it's a big ocean. It's a very big ocean. And uh, uh, it, we're, we're doing a really good job. Attorney General Jeff Sessions said today that freedom of speech on college campuses is under threat. The American University was once the center of academic freedom, a place of robust debate, a forum for the competition of ideas. But it is transforming into an echo chamber of political correctness and homogeneous thought, a shelter for fragile egos. As he spoke, protesters gathered outside Georgetown University's law school, and some students told Vice News that their invitations to attend the speech had been rescinded. Federal prosecutors in New York announced charges against 10 people, including four Division I NCAA assistant coaches. College coaches took cash bribes from managers and advisors in exchange for directing players and their families to those bribers. A senior executive at Adidas was also charged with funneling bribes to get players to go to universities sponsored by the company. Adidas and the coaches' school said they were surprised by the charges and that they would cooperate with the investigation. In a major reversal, Saudi Arabia announced it'll allow women to drive. The ultra-conservative kingdom is the only country in the world where women don't have the right, and some women who've defied the ban have been arrested for it. For years, Saudi officials and clerics said it was inappropriate for women to drive, and that it would be a threat to society if they did. Three years ago tonight, 43 students from a rural teacher's college in southern Mexico disappeared after a confrontation with security forces. The case is still unsolved. Their disappearance is only the most high-profile instance of a deeper problem. According to government figures, more than 32,000 Mexicans are currently missing. And it's the search for the 43 that's compelled the relatives of these other missing people to take up their own searches, scouring the countryside for any remains they can find. Chocolatito! Mario Vergara brings his dog with him whenever he ventures into the hills to find buried bodies. She's there to alert him to the presence of people and wild animals. But finding the graves is up to Vergara himself, with help from hunters and others who stumble on traces of the disappeared in the forest. Busco a mi hermano, a mi hermano Tomás. A él lo secuestraron el 5 de julio del 2012. In the last three years, he's found dozens of bodies, and although none of them were his brothers, the search has become an end in itself. He caminado desiertos, he caminado bosques, he caminado canales de aguas negras. Y te puedo asegurar que en cualquier parte del país puede haber una persona desaparecida enterrada. Like the vast majority in his position, Vergara doesn't know who took his brother. Only the kidnappings of everyday people are frequent and nobody ever gets caught. We followed Vergara to an abandoned campsite where he believes kidnappers had held a group of hostages. Esta es la funda de una pistola. 
hemos encontrado más de 170 cuerpos enteros enterrados en los cerros. Y con frecuencia los encuentran cerca de campamentos como este. Sí. Vergara es one in a loose movement of buscadores, or searchers, which originated here in the southern state of Guerrero in 2014, after 43 students disappeared in the small city of Iguala. The search for the students' remains, though fruitless, turned up hundreds of other bodies in the hills, inspiring people like Vergara to search for their own loved ones. Yo no lo busqué por miedo. Nunca lo busqué hasta que pasó la desaparición de los 43 estudiantes en Iguala. The case of the 43 missing students blew the cover off of the epidemic of forced disappearances in Mexico. Now, three years later, the NGO that represents their families in court has commissioned a full reconstruction of events from an agency called Forensic Architecture, which pulls together for the first time every known fact about the case. The students came from a school with a tradition of radical left-wing activism. And on the night they disappeared, they were in buses they had commandeered to drive to a protest in the capital. As they tried to leave Iguala, they were ambushed simultaneously in two different locations by security forces, all the way from the local to the federal, acting in concert with organized crime. The exact motive for the attacks remains unclear, though the reigning theory is that one of the buses, unbeknownst to the students, was loaded with drugs or cash, and that corrupt officials brought the full force of the state down to stop them from taking it. But that's not what the government says. According to the Mexican Attorney General, which is prosecuting the case, the attacks were an act of petty retaliation for the students' political activities, and only a small number of local officials were involved. Investigative journalist Anabel Hernández covered the case from the beginning for the magazine Proceso and also published a book about the 43. Así que lo que puedo decir es que la versión oficial del gobierno de México sobre el caso de los 43 normalistas de principio a fin es absolutamente falsa. Esta negligencia del gobierno, este no resolver el caso, es porque el gobierno prefirió eh, no hacer justicia en este caso para encubrir a los verdaderos responsables. Estamos hablando de un crimen de Estado. Hernández views the disappearance of the 43 as just one symptom of a much larger problem. Untold numbers of government officials participate actively in organized crime. And in a country where the military and police have been deployed on a massive scale, ostensibly to fight the cartels, this means thousands of heavily armed men who can kill with impunity. Para que la gente se dé una idea, el 98% de los crímenes en México no se resuelven. Al gobierno no le importan los desaparecidos. Porque cómo puede ser posible que al gobierno no le importen los desaparecidos de su propio de su propia población. Yo tengo la hipótesis de que porque en la gran mayoría de las desapariciones hay al menos un agente del gobierno involucrado. The Mexican Attorney General's office did not respond to any of our questions. We did, however, speak with a spokesman from the Guerrero state government who agreed to discuss the larger question of forced disappearances and who acknowledged that government corruption is partly to blame. Desde la desaparición de los 43, se han encontrado cientos de cadáveres en fosas clandestinas en los cerros de Guerrero. ¿Eso cómo se explica? El principal problema se llama impunidad, que se va a acabar si acabamos con la corrupción y logramos consolidar un sistema de justicia penal que sea sólido, fuerte, y haya corporaciones policíacas fuertes. ¿Ha habido alguna sentencia por desaparición forzada en el estado de Guerrero? No conozco si existen. Es un dato que yo te la debo. The answer is no. According to a report by the Mexican Commission on Human Rights, there were no such sentences in Guerrero before 2015 and the governor's office was unable to provide examples of any since then. That leaves Mario Vergara and searchers like him alone to recover the missing. It's a risky endeavor. Vergara and his family receive threats on a regular basis. In este país, it's más fácil encontrar la muerte que encontrar justicia. Vergara took us to a place in the hills where a worker mending a barbed wire fence found a human foot. Este es otro, otro hueso más grande. Y si tú rompes el calcetín, vas a encontrar los huesos más chicos. Estos son de personas. 
As Vergara prepared to dig to make sure the rest of the body was there, he heard a car pulling up the hill from the highway. But it was a false alarm. After a few minutes of careful digging, he found a shin bone sticking out of the second shoe, and the rest followed. Mira, 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 aquí está la clavícula. ¿Ya viste? Entonces este lo deben enterrado así. La cabeza va a estar como para acá, como que lo doblaron. Esta es una falange. Este es un metacarpo. Pensé que aquí hay una persona. De momento se ve una, no sabemos cuántas hay. Los muertos me molestan, no me dejan dormir. President Trump took another swing at North Korea today, promising that he's totally prepared to order a military strike. If we take that option, it will be devastating. I can tell you that devastating for North Korea. That's called the military option. If we have to take it, we will. It's classic Trumpism. Show strength no matter what. But nuclear experts say that approach could be a big mistake. North Korea has been marching towards nuclear capability and making a lot of threats for a long time now. But most Americans never really had to worry about it because the U.S. has so many more nuclear weapons of its own. It's basically an exercise in game theory, which is what so much of nuclear strategy is based on. The logic holds that North Korea would never actually try a nuclear attack on the U.S. or our allies because if they did, we'd immediately wipe them off the map. And they know it. This is what nuclear theorists call the massive retaliation strategy. And it works pretty well at deterring an attack, or it did. But with Trump's increasingly aggressive rhetoric and actions, it turns out there's another scenario at play here, one that applies specifically to weaker powers with smaller nuclear arsenals. It's called asymmetric escalation. And it plays out like this. A conventional attack from the US on North Korea could easily destroy Kim Jong-un's nuclear arsenal or decapitate his regime. If an attack is underway, or even if Kim just thinks one is, he has a limited amount of time to fire off his nukes before they're gone, or he won't be around to use them. With the technology he has, he could likely hit Guam and definitely hit our allies in Japan and South Korea. In doing so, he would hope that he could shock the Americans enough to think twice about their attack. What's most scary about this scenario is that it doesn't require Kim Jong-un to be some sort of suicidal madman to decide to use one of his nukes first. Vipin Narang, an expert on nuclear strategy at MIT, explains it this way. The more rational Kim is, the itchier his trigger finger will be, especially now when he has a small, vulnerable nuclear arsenal, because he has to worry about what we call a use them or lose them dilemma. You know, he can't be sure that his nuclear forces would survive a conventional attack or an attempt to disarm him. And so his personal calculation is his only theory of survival is if he uses nuclear weapons to slow the conventional invasion down and stop the conventional attack. Now, wouldn't the U.S. respond to a nuclear attack on our soil or our treaty allies by incinerating North Korea? Maybe. But the U.S. would have to be sure that Kim wasn't holding anything in reserve and that he wouldn't fire off a parting volley of nukes or even intense conventional weapons. Being sure of that is nearly impossible. And if we're wrong, it could mean hundreds of thousands of lives. Because the key to asymmetric conflict is that a destitute and isolated country like North Korea has relatively little to lose, and the prosperous US has everything to lose. For coal workers who've lost their jobs in recent years and borne the brunt of an industry slowdown, the answer to their employment woes might just be found in wind. 
wind turbine technician is the fastest growing job in the country, and one Chinese-owned manufacturing company is trying to convert fossil fuel veterans into an alternative energy labor force. But despite the potential for good jobs, the wind sector is still meeting some fierce resistance. When we're climbing, this is to be strapped at all times, okay? Since losing his coal job in 2015, Jason Wilbanks has cobbled together a living by driving coal employees to work. Now, he's looking to make a change. So Jason, you guys are going to Tower 9. We met him at a job program held by Goldwind Americas, a Chinese-owned company that's part of one of the largest wind turbine manufacturers in the world, and that's trying to bring wind farming to Wyoming. Any questions? All right, let's go get some equipment. Medium. Goldwind's training program, which is free and is split between a test site in Montana and information sessions across Wyoming, has attracted a lot of out-of-work coal employees like Jason. Last year uh, was a horrible time to be unemployed um, up here in northeastern Wyoming, okay. for sure. Have you heard a lot about the wind energy industry in Wyoming? I haven't heard a lot of the wind industry in Wyoming. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, living in Wyoming, I've felt a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes me very irritable sometimes. Sure. <laughs> and if I can use it to pay my bills and support my family, then maybe I'll learn to like it a little better. On the surface, Wyoming is a great candidate for wind farms. It's one of the windiest states in the country. But many Wyoming residents haven't welcomed the new industry. What are the people around you, your friends, your family? They what don't are they... like the wind energy. They don't? No, not, not my recent colleagues. They find that it's imposing on what they do for a living. Meaning that it's encroaching on yeah. the oil and gas industry and, and taking away from it? It's taken away from That's what they feel. You get some people who don't like wind energy, some families, some strangers who come from different backgrounds. What kind yeah. of backgrounds? They used to work in the oil field or the coal mines. and I mean, they'll tease you, they'll call you names, say you're liberals or greenies. State legislators have also been stubborn in their commitment to fossil fuels. Wyoming is one of only two states in the country that has a wind tax. State Representative Michael Madden okay. supports that tax and wants to raise it. Some people argue that the wind industry shouldn't be taxed as much as the fossil fuel industry in Wyoming because what you get from wind is a renewable energy, right? It's not going to yeah. go away. Whereas the reason why the fossil fuel industry is taxed is because you're taking something out of the ground and you're not going to get it back. Do you think that that is a fair argument? Well, it, it is if, we, if you're sufficiently uh, narrow about it. You know, we look at the loss of, of the aesthetics of Wyoming mm. that will never come back. We will run out of wide open space that everybody in Wyoming is living here for. Madden says that because wind turbines ruin people's view, they deserve to be taxed like any other energy source. As a result, despite having some of the highest wind potential in the country, Wyoming ranks 15th in the current wind energy output with only a thousand turbines. And experts estimate that it will take at least five years to get new wind farms up and running in the state. I don't know how long it takes to train a wind technician, but I would assume that it takes less than five years. They're actually going to hold a training program that's two weeks long. That makes me think that it's more of a publicity move. Goldwing, I think they've got projects that they're working on, but they don't have any construction going yet. To me, it's, it's putting false hope in some of these poor guys' uh, minds that here I'm going to have a prospect of a job. But, and I think this job will come, but it may not be for a, a long time. Let me take one of you guys with me on this one. Yep, come on up, bud. All right, make sure your helmets are connected and we're ready to do this. It's easy to see why people like Michael Madden think Goldwyn's training program is a publicity stunt. Right now, there are only 4,400 wind techs nationwide. But according to David Halligan, CEO of the America's Division of Goldwyn, the training program is a long-term strategy. Are you going to be able to hire hundreds of people? Well, if you, if you look at the projects that are planned to go into Wyoming, they're going to require hundreds of people. As they build out over the next five years, they're going to need that talent. And why not start reaching out soon? I was told by a representative in Wyoming that what you guys are doing is a publicity stunt. Is it? 
absolutely not. The jobs are going to be there. We need people. And even if they don't work for a Goldwyn wind farm, um, hopefully they at least have that experience from us that in the future when Goldwyn is one of the top uh, wind technology companies in this country, they'll say, I received some initial training from Goldwyn. I'll love to go work with them. Could you see yourself doing this on a regular basis, you know, for a living? I think so, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's rewarding, both monetarily and physically. Yeah. Um, so you're going to do that two-week of training? Yeah, I think I will, yeah, for sure. My current job, I, um, I drive. I want something that's going to challenge me physically, mentally. I have more to offer to a company than just driving a van all day. Mount Agung, an active volcano on Bali, could erupt at any minute. More than 75,000 people have already evacuated the area. The last time Mount Agung erupted in 1963, more than 1,500 people were killed. Scientists aren't sure exactly when it'll happen again or how extreme it'll be, but most agree that any eruption could have counterintuitive consequences, slowing the effects of global warming. Volcanoes can put millions of tons of sulfur dioxide gas directly into the stratosphere. So what happens is the sulfur gas turns into these droplets of sulfate aerosol, which are very shiny and reflect sunlight back to space. So a certain percentage of the sunlight scatters back out into space and doesn't get to the surface to heat up the planet. And we know historically that's had, in some cases, very significant cooling effects on the surface of the planet. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo put a lot of sulfur into the stratosphere and caused a cooling of about a degree Fahrenheit over a year and a half or so. If a gun puts as much as Pinatubo, we could see reduction in the global average temperature. Not for me, man. Not for me. Not for me, mate. It better be fucking good, then. I'm having it. I like the bass and the drums and the distorted guitars. Yeah? And the vocals were all right as well. What do you imagine the band looks like? God, probably horrible. They all sound good then, but look like uh, nerds or something. They sound pissed off, which I fucking like. Fuck, ugly God, ugly God a hoe. Flexing like you got it, bitch, I know your ass is broke. Your network say you got a million, but your ass don't. You're all right, man. He's talking about hoes and bitches and shit, innit, right? And all that stuff. Yeah, I'm not keen on all that, but uh, it's good tune, no, man. It's all right. I mean, I wouldn't buy it and that. I mean, it's not my kind of style, but I, li I like the big boom stuff, yeah. Uh, you She's asking for flowers, man. You can't ask for flowers, you know what I mean? You either get them or you don't, you know what I mean? It's like, do you know what I mean? Asking for chocolates next, won't she? Such a short way up and such a long way down. Reggae! Good voice, man. Yeah, I like this. I just like it. I like his tones, man. He's good. And, he, you know, he obviously smokes weed and that. So that was good. And who is it? Damien Marley. All oh, right, yeah, man. I've been carrying his weed around in London for a bit because we've got the same driver and that in London. But if we get fucking pulled over by the dibble, I get caught with all the ganja. So that's and the car smells nice though. So that's good. I love you, Mary Jane. That's Vice News tonight for Tuesday, September 26th. 